we begin the sermon. Um, since the summer, there's been a group chaired by uh, Cyril Stewart, who's the uh, chair elect of our congregation, uh, called the Strategic Planning Group, and they are uh, looking to the future of our church and asking questions about ministries and programs and facilities. And there is a survey uh, that went out on Friday, and it will go out again this week. And if you would take the time to fill that out and give us your feedback, that would be uh, very, very helpful for this group as we uh, move forward uh, in the months ahead. Let's pray. Loving God, speak to us once again through our text today, and may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was a man who was down on his luck, and he went into a, a church that was known for catering to the rich, affluent, more uppity class. And spotting the man's dirty clothes, one of the deacons walked over to him, and uh, he was worried about the church's image, and so he, he went and asked him if he needed help. And the man said, I've been praying to God, and God told me to come and visit this church. And the deacon said, well, why don't you go pray again and see if God gives you a, a different answer? So the next week, the man came back, and the same deacon walked up to him and said, did you go and, and, and pray to God? And did he give you a different answer? And the man replied, yes, I did. I told the Lord that they don't want me in that church. And the Lord replied and said, don't worry, son, it's okay. I've been trying to get into that church for years, and they've never let me in there either. We've been journeying through the Gospel of Luke uh, since the end of the summer now. So for about uh, two or three months, we've been looking at Luke's Gospel. Last Sunday, we looked at the uh, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, and we talked about humility and what humility is. We asked the question, how do you live a humble life? We reflected upon those powerful words of the prophet Micah, who asked the question, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? And I shared with you three phrases that I think will help all of us on that path to humility. They're phrases that I try to incorporate in my own life more and more. We should learn to say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, and please help me. And as tough as these words are to say, it's important that we are not afraid to say them in our own lives. Today we come to Luke chapter 19, the story of Zacchaeus. And Luke tells us that Jesus is entering Jericho, and in that town, there lived a chief tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. And he heard that Jesus was coming to town, and so he wanted to go and see him. The only problem was the crowds were so big, and Zacchaeus was so small that he could not get a clear view of Jesus. So what does he do? He climbs up a sycamore tree to the place where he knew Jesus was going to be passing by. And then when Jesus gets to that spot, he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, come down, for I must go to your house today. Now, when the crowds heard this, they were shocked because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was not a popular guy. He was rich, and he was the last person that the crowds would have expected Jesus to single out and say, I'm going to your house today. William Barclay says that Zacchaeus was wealthy, but he was not happy. Inevitably, he was lonely, for he had chosen a way that had made him an outcast. He had heard of this Jesus who welcomed sinners and tax collectors, and he wondered if Jesus would have a word for him. Despised and rejected by men, Zacchaeus was reaching after the love of God. You see, if Zacchaeus had stayed down among the crowds that day and had not climbed that tree, chances are he might have been roughed up and tossed around a little bit. He was a little guy, but the crowd would have had no problem pushing him aside, throwing an elbow into him. They didn't like him. They resented him. But Jesus said, Zacchaeus, get out of the tree. I'm going to your house today. And after he goes to Zacchaeus' house, Luke tells us that something transformative happens. This little rich tax collector who didn't have any friends, 
who had apparently defrauded all kinds of people, all of a sudden had a change of heart. And he tells Jesus, look, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anybody, I will pay them back four times. And Jesus responds by saying, today salvation has come to this house. Let me pose a hypothetical question this morning for you to consider. What would happen if Jesus came to your house? unannounced, unexpected, and I don't mean for a brief visit of a couple hours. I mean, what if Jesus came to your house and stayed for a week, and everywhere you would go, he would go. Everything you would do, he would do. Everything you would say, he would hear. Every interaction you would have, he would witness. What would that be like? Somebody wrote a poem a number of years ago under the same question, what if Jesus came to your house? And it goes like this. If Jesus came to your house to spend some time with you, if he came unexpected, I wonder what you'd do. Oh, I know you'd give your nicest room to such an honored guest, and all the food you'd give to him would be the very best. And you would keep assuring him you're glad to have him there. That serving him in your home is joy beyond compare. But when you saw him coming, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched and welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes before you let him in or hide some magazines and put the Bible where they'd been? Would you hide your worldly music and put some hymn books out? Could you let Jesus walk right in or would you rush about? And I wonder if the Savior spent a day or two with you, would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you always say, or would life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you go, or would you maybe change your plans for just a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your closest friends, or would you hope they stayed away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on, or would you sigh with great relief at last when he was gone? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do if Jesus came in person to spend some time with you. Take a minute this morning and put yourself in Zacchaeus' place. Jesus is coming to your house unannounced, and he's not just coming for a brief visit, he's coming to stay a while. What do you think he would say to you? What would you talk to him about? What would you ask him? What do you think he'd want to go and do? Would you bring him to church? What would he think about our church? Would you bring him to the bridge or to the 11 o'clock service or the 930? What would he say about your marriage and how you treat your spouse and how you interact with your family members? We're going to talk more about that next week. Would you quickly go and sign up for Room in the Inn or sign up to go on a National Food Project run so Jesus could go with you? Would you join that Bible study or that prayer group you've been thinking about joining for some time now? Would you be more patient and kind, more loving and generous Which of your friends would you introduce him to? Which of your friends would you hope stayed away that week? Would you turn on the news at night? Which channel? Fox? CNN? MSNBC? The Daily Show? The Colbert Report? Would you give him the newspaper to read in the morning? Which one? The New York Times? The Wall Street Journal? The Tennessean? What would he say about Obamacare and the government shutdown? What would he say about immigration reform? Would he tell you to quit worrying about the stock market? Would he tell you to put your iPhone down and just be present for a little while? Would you take him to a college football game? What about the tailgate? If you ran out of wine, he could come into use at that point, right? (laughs) Do you think he'd want to go to the mall? Which stores? Macy's, Nordstrom's, David Yerman? 
If you were to take him out to eat, what do you think his preference would be? The farmer's market, J. Alexander's, Sperry's, King Prime, Catbird Seed? If Jesus could change you, how would he change you? If he could give you some advice, what advice would he give you? If he could stop one bad habit from happening in your life, what would that habit be? I don't know about you, but I find these questions a little bit fascinating. And I wonder how Zacchaeus felt that day in Jericho. Some of you remember a guy in this town by the name of Rubel Shelley. Rubel was a pastor at Woodmont Hills Church of Christ over on uh, uh, Franklin Road for about 27 years. And then he went on to become a president of a college up in uh, Rochester, Michigan. And I've heard he's just recently retired from that. But Rubel wrote a book uh, a couple years ago called I Knew Jesus Before He Was a Christian and I Liked Him Better Then. And it's a great book. I'd recommend it to you. But the basic claim is that the Jesus of history and the Jesus of common perception are two very different persons. And he feels that the church has done a poor job of representing Jesus and his message over the past 2,000 years to the extent to where Jesus has become unattractive for a number of people. Shelley quotes American scholar Sam Pasco, who is known for this quote. Christianity was born in Israel only to be taken to Greece and morphed into a philosophy. From there it was taken to Rome and made into an institution of civil power. Eventually it migrated into Europe where it was developed into a culture and later it was brought to America where it was made into an entrepreneurial business enterprise. He says that when we institutionalized Jesus, we watered down core parts of his message and we started becoming more concerned with maintenance and doctrine and correct beliefs and power and blending Jesus with the culture. And so now what we have is a society where a lot of people really don't know who Jesus was or what he said or what he stood for because he's been distorted for so many years. We've made Jesus into what we want him to be rather than allowing his message to speak for itself. Towards the end of that book, Shelley refers to an article that was written a number of years ago by a guy named Gordon McDonald. And Gordon McDonald is now the chancellor of Denver a Seminary out in Colorado. But in that article, he focuses on the personal ministry of Jesus Christ, and he makes six basic points. First, he says, Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life growing in stature and in favor with God and man. He built bridges of understanding with family, neighbors, and fellow Israelites before launching his rescue mission among them. Jesus established relationships before he issued challenges. Secondly, the main focus of Jesus' ministry was always building up people. He would often move away from and shun big crowds in order to spend time on a few people that nobody thought would ever amount to much. Shelley says that sometimes today we become so obsessed with building big churches, big ministries, big names for ourselves that that becomes our only focus in life. And so we should ask, what's our motive? Do we love people? Third, Jesus refused to entangle himself in institutional activities. Yes, he went to the synagogue and the temple, but he spent most of his time teaching at parties on boats, in fields, and walking along the road in stark contrast to people then and now who measure success in terms of size and numbers and dollars he was content to seek and confer significance by being ordinary, unnoticed, and powerless. Wish I could take you guys with me to some of these clergy conferences where all they want to talk about is the worship size and the budget. Fourth, Jesus was big on denouncing injustice and self-righteousness, but he spent precious little time debating theology. He vehemently censored those who tried to set themselves as judges of other people's spirituality. Jesus didn't have a whole lot of time or patience in his life 
for self-righteous people. In fact, he was constantly criticizing the religious folks of his day. Fifth, Jesus always seemed more concerned about people's hearts than their heads. Shelley says he was angriest when dealing with the religious leaders and their power brokers. Nobody can love the weak, pursue the powerless, and treat disreputable people with kindness without being suspect in a religious culture. Let me say that again. Nobody can love the weak, pursue the powerless, and treat disreputable people with kindness without being suspect in a religious culture. Now there's something for us to think about. And lastly, McDonald says that the ultimate foundation for Jesus' whole ministry was his intimate relationship with God. He drew strength from his father's words. He continually withdrew from the crowds to go and spend time alone in prayer and in solitude. And God constantly affirmed him by blessing what he did. You see, there is no substitute in life for time spent alone with God. And we're all guilty of neglecting that. When we don't spend time alone with God, we feel it, and so do the others around us. When Jesus came to Zacchaeus' house that day in Jericho, something happened to change Zacchaeus' heart. He saw the world differently. He was tired of living the way that he had been living. And I can only conclude that if Jesus were to come to my house or to your house, we would be changed as well. Our priorities would be a little bit different. We might watch some of the things that we say about other people. We would probably be kinder and less anxious and more willing to go and love and serve. Cutting through the baggage of organized religion the politics, the power struggles, the conflict, the positioning is absolutely essential to fully understanding what Jesus was all about and what we should be all about. What if Jesus came to your house unannounced? What would change? 